Building blocks are known worldwide. Its brand is among the globe's most admired. It's the fastest growing toy maker on the planet. We're at a company that less than a decade ago was losing a million dollars a day and that's been transformed. It is going to be, I think, in the coming years, a case study in how you turn around a company. We're going inside Lego. Awesome! Everything is awesome. The theme music to the Lego movie could well be the theme for the company itself. In February this year, Lego revealed a set of numbers that confirmed its position as the world's most profitable toy maker, with net income as a percentage of sales and eye-watering 24%, trouncing toy maker rivals Mattel and Hasbro. The company's dominating the construction segment of the toy market, a category it basically created. They've certainly driven the growth of the category, and that category has in turn driven the growth of toys and games as an industry, especially in the traditional toys and games sense. Um, so they've been pivotal in, in that respect, um, and they certainly have a, a huge advantage uh, having such um, a force of nature in, in that uh, particular category, being able to uh, manufacture um, a lot of different uh, toys and, and replicate this in their factories and then create the best margins as possible. And 2013 was quite a year. More than 55 billion Lego elements were made. That's 105,000 pieces a minute and more than 600 billion since the company was founded in 1932. That's at least 80 for every human being on the planet. Oh, and at 500 million tires a year, it's one of the world's largest tire makers. Some sets aren't just for kids. David Beckham reportedly built this model of London's Tower Bridge for its therapeutic value. If you thought that was impressive, the largest set is the Taj Mahal, nearly 6,000 individual pieces. Beckham didn't finish that one. Each second, 10 Lego sets are sold. And then there's the run-up to Christmas, when 34 sets a second are sold. Lego does about 60% of its sales in the lead-up to Christmas. The company reckons the world's children spend five billion hours a year playing with its bricks. But the brand has inspired more than just toys. There are 50 Lego video games and counting, not to mention... Relax, everybody, I'm here. Batman? The movie. Oh, the last seven or eight years, we have had double-digit growth every year. You know, that's mind-blowing. Lego's origins lie in a small town in Denmark with the dream of a carpenter. We are now in the founder, Ole Kirk Christiansen, and his old house. Ole uh, was uh, a carpenter and joiner before starting to produce wooden toys. He plays with the two Danish words, lie, gut, which means play well. In 1960, we had a, a, a fire in our woodworking factory. And because of this, we uh, made the decision to stop the production of wooden toys. And actually also to stop the production of the plastic toys that was not a part of the Lego system and the Lego brick. So basically, from 60 onwards, we say, let's focus solely on the Lego brick. Where did the whole idea of the brick come from? And these bricks? Well, what happens in, uh, in, uh, in the late 40s is that Ole starts to supplement his production of wooden toys with, with plastic products. And then in 1949, he produces the first uh, plastic bricks. Back then, he calls them automatic binding bricks. The early bricks were hollow. There's no clutch power. Mm. You cannot, in, there isn't anything underneath to, to grab hold of, of this knob. Mm -hmm. So that was a problem. The brick, the hollow brick here, sets sort of the limitations of what you can build. After thinking about it long and hard for, for many years, we eventually come up with this. Uh, now we, we simply add these tubes and you have clutch power. It sticks. So this is so, this is genius. This is really is the, 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 the most important thing that has ever happened in this company's history. For example, these two bricks in the same color, they can be two by four bricks. They can be combined in 24 different ways. And if I have three of these, it's 1,060 different combinations. And if I have six bricks with the tubes in the same color still, 
I can combine these in 915,103,765 different ways. So the possibilities are, well, endless, because I do not have the imagination to combine these bricks in almost a billion ways, but it is possible. As we know, Lego became a household name, loved by children, loved by parents. But by the early 2000s, the company was in trouble. It had lost its way in terms of understanding its own self-identity. What is Lego uniquely about? We'll be back with the story of a 36-year-old former McKinsey consultant who executed one of the turnarounds of the century. Lego is the fastest growing toy maker on the planet, but just 10 years ago, the company was foundering. Lego did not understand its core business. And because Lego did not understand its core business, Lego underestimated its own strengths. The company expanded its theme parks, opened stores, started a video games division, published books, added clothing lines. All these examples of business areas in which Lego had no uh, knowledge and therefore they uh, lost huge of, uh, amount of money. Lego was approaching going bust and in 2004 actually Morgan Stanley sent three executives to Billon and uh, met with the owner Kirk Ke Christiansen and suggested to him that Morgan Stanley should <coughs> sell a Lego for him because if he did not uh, sell Lego now, the price would just uh, go down later on. Enter Jürgen Vig Knudstorp. Knudstorp was just 36 years old when Lego's owner, Kjell Kirk Christiansen, appointed him chief executive. He's the fourth CEO of the company, the first from outside the founding family. He's got two master's degrees, one in economics and the other in business administration. Before joining Lego in 2001, Knudstorp worked at McKinsey, the global consulting firm. Lego is meant to doing good for the children of the world. That's the aspiration of the owner, Kjell Christiansen. And Jan Vee understands that. He shares the same values. I wanted to ask Lego's saviour, what went wrong? It didn't understand how it was making money or where it wasn't making money. Quite frankly, we were not really uh, disciplined in our operational processes. There was a poor match between forecast and manufacturing. There was very much a limited sharing of data. Uh, we didn't understand where to uh, invest first. We didn't know which customers, which products lines were the most profitable. So we called it business understanding, commercial orientation, basically. And we put ourselves some very simple goals alongside right-sizing, downsizing certain aspects of the business, selling off activities. We really had a very operational focus, which was we said, we have to make our customers profitable uh, and doing that by offering the right portfolio to them. And the other thing was that it had lost its way in terms of understanding its own self-identity. What is Lego uniquely about? To answer that question, Knudstorp started talking to his customers, and the biggest were retailers. I had a very memorable conversation with the then CEO, Lee Scott of Walmart, who said to me, you got to understand that I run a much simpler business than you do. And I was puzzled by this, but his point was he ran in the US a chain of 1,500 more or less very similar stores, whereas we were operating globally on a vertical integration from basic manufacturing into assembly, into global distribution, into their stores, but also into our own stores, and then on top, uh, Legoland parks. So obviously, from an operational perspective, a much more complex task. Knudstorp set about streamlining the business. He sold the Lego theme parks, cut the number of elements Lego designers could use from 13,000 to 7,000. All while sales fell 20% in 2004, only to grow 5% the following year. At the time, the company didn't even seek growth. Many of us found it very difficult, but I think it was fantastic because growth is like a sugar coating on your problems. You don't see them so well when you're not growing. When you're not growing, you really have to drive productivity. So that allowed us a lot of time to rebase and refocus the business. And we tried to focus on only doing the things where we had unique advantages. And thankfully, Lego as a brand and as the core product, the brick and the building system is very unique. So we had that base, we had that base of consumers who were very loyal. And then we said, how can we make products for them? We don't know how big that business is going to be, 
but we're going to go back to that core. So what we did was we started with that fundamental question, why do you exist? To find out, he asked LEGO's biggest fans. In the Danish capital of Copenhagen, 10,000 people swarm under one roof. It's not a music concert or a football match. It's what's known in the LEGO world as a brickfest, a fan event that spans the ages. The grown-ups showing off their unofficial creations here are known as AFOLs, adult fans of LEGO. It's events like this where the relationship between the fans and the company is on show. Some fans have even lobbied the brickmaker to make special parts for their creations. This year I got my first brick. It's a round tile with a hole in the middle. With this tile, it is a smooth surface and no, uh, with less torque, so now my motors can run more freely. But it hasn't always been like this. LEGO's been very protective of its packaged toy sets, and in particular, its brand. Recognizing fan creations that didn't come in a box with instructions wasn't easy. Initially, LEGO was like, oh, no, please not. And then they welcomed it with open arms. And so much, actually, that they set into life a community, a special community for Mindstorms fans. Martin and his team traveled from the Netherlands for this breakfast. His team works with the more advanced Mindstorms LEGO, combining plastic bricks with computing. That's what's powering this LEGO conveyor belt they're showing off here. Understanding the logic behind the technology of the brick is as important for these fans as playing with it. What we actually do here is sometimes, well, we call it reverse engineering. We look what LEGO did and we look inside and then we try to figure out, by the way, how did they do that? Now, if you look at some, some other brands, they are very close. They don't want you to, to look at what is inside. LEGO actually opened up and they said, after some time, here's all the instructions, here's the whole thing, here's how we build it. This is the inside, the schematics, the internals. Now, that limits, uh, that, that actually opens some limits that were there before. LEGO's embraced the relationship, as well as forums and product dialogues with their fans, they've even started employing some of them. Lessa was at college when he built his first Mindstorms creation. The company was so impressed, they gave him a job. We started traveling the world with LEGO, just showing off inventions. We, we've done big sorting, sorting machines, we've done blimps, we've done forklifts. And just, just showing, showing kids how big you can think with LEGO, that there's really no limitation. You can do whatever you want, just if you just have the imagination and the patience. After consulting retailers, children, suppliers, employees and fans like these, Knudstorp felt that he could answer the question. What is LEGO? Lego is a material that's endlessly creative and at the same time extremely logical because everything fits in almost like a digital way of zeros and ones. It is the only material in the world that acts as if it was glued and yet you can easily take it apart. There is no other system like this one that we've invented and we have taken it to an extreme degree in terms of quality, in terms of expansion, in terms of depth of innovation, in terms of constant uh, renewal. Our name is completely synonymous with the idea of modular pieces that can be put together in, in an infinite number of ways. We'll be back after the break to show how these endlessly creative bricks are made and to introduce you to the Lego Billionaires. If Lego minifigures were humans, there'd be enough of them to populate Asia. Lego's other bits number in the hundreds of billions and producing that many is like a military operation. It starts with moulding. This is where the bricks are made. Plastic pellets are shot by air along these pipes. They're delivered into this machine where they're heated into a sort of a dough that's then injected into this mould. And the incredible thing is the precision that means that each brick that comes out of here can click and stick onto any other brick that's being made by Lego. So many parts are made, Lego has a surprising way to ferry them out. See this behind me? It's a robot, there's no driver, it goes around and collects the bricks. But don't worry, it won't bump into me. Once the parts are ready, they're sent for decoration and assembly. Each of these can have as many as 12 levels of detail added to it. And you can see on this machine, each of these stages is adding a level of paint before they're flipped over and they're painted on the back. 
I find this assembly machine absolutely mesmerizing because there are 35 different steps here. They're adding the arms to the torsos, then the hands to the arms. There's one part of this process that we're not allowed to show you at the moment. They're painting the faces of some new figurines that aren't gonna come out until next year. Absolutely no cameras, top secret. With so many parts being thrown together, it's a miracle the right ones end up in the right bag. Or is it? They used to do that by hand. Loads of room for error. Now they've got these machines. This one's doing grey bricks. I've got a yellow one here. It's the wrong shape. It's the wrong size. Rejected. Now it's a third and final phase. Packaging. Any scuffs on the box or bits poking out are snapped up by super smart cameras and sensors. This one product line sees 1,400 boxes packed in just one hour. It's this focus on production, product development, marketing the brick that's helped the company quadruple in size in the past decade. And that's been good for the founding Christiansen family. As the company grew, the children of Kjeldkjør Christiansen, already Denmark's richest man, joined him in the Billionaires Club. Christiansen the Elder owns 51% of Kirkby, an investment company that owns 75% of the brickmaker. His children, Sophie, Thomas and Agneta, own the remaining share of Kirkby. Lego itself is valued at about $18.5 billion, which means that via Kirkby, Kjeldkjør Christiansen's stake is worth a cool $7 billion, while each of the kids is sitting on about $2.3 billion each. And that doesn't take into account Kirkby's other assets, among them a $2 billion stake in Merlin Entertainment, which has the Lego theme parks, Madame Tussauds and the London Eye among its assets. In the past few years, Lego's had a string of hit products thanks to its now intense market research and it's been filling in the gaps in its offer. Once a company is able to get a child and a family, because the parents are buying these products um, at, at birth, um, from the cradle, if you like, then it makes it easier to have that brand recognition and brand equity and carry it through the life cycle of all their products. So there is one product that goes from the next to the next to the next. And that means money. The LEGO Friends line, launched in 2011, is one of them. Aimed at girls who LEGO previously assumed weren't interested in building. A few focus groups sorted that out. We actually spent uh, four years developing this product line and in those four years we engaged in so many talks with children asking them, so do you like this color? Should it be this color instead? What about this product? Do we want, is this something you would play with or do we want this instead? You know, we talked so much with consumers, both parents and of course children. What's going on in this one? I think that's the, oh, it's the ice cream shop, I think. An ice oh, cream it's shop? The vet. It's the vet. I actually think it's the, the vet we have right there. So you've got a vet over here. There's a pet shop. Yes. Cafe. Is there a nail salon? And no. <laughs> I think there is. Uh, <laughs> but one of the key things that we actually found out uh, in, in these four years was that what the, the problem with the products we have introduced for girls earlier was that we really didn't think that girls wanted to build and construct. So it was a lot of sort of pre-made things. But then we actually discovered that girls w would very much like to construct and build what they want to play with. And then another part is, of course, all these little, um, you know, little details, you know, the bows and all these different things. That's very much something that girls enjoy playing with having these um, many details. So a girl can take a little butterfly and yes. put that wherever she yes, wants. Exactly. She can decorate it however she wants. And of course, you know... And these though, flowers here. Yes, exactly. And even though, you know, this, this, uh, these figures, uh, well, they are actually not called figures, they are called dolls. They are different from the minifigure, as mm -hmm. you can uh, see, but of course, these are completely compatible with the LEGO system. So you can combine, for example, all of this and you can combine it with, for example, LEGO City. LEGO's next challenge is distribution into the relatively untouched markets of Latin America and Asia. A reason it's opening a factory in China. We're not going there for the labor cost advantage, for instance. We basically want to see the world in three vertical regions, the Americas, 
Europe, Middle East, Africa, and then obviously Asia. So we're looking to have a manufacturing hub in each of the three regions. So we're within the same time zone, roughly, and able to supply our major customers with a very short lead time. Because this, the seasonality is different in Asia, but still we do, well, our retailers do 60% of their business in the nine weeks leading up to New Year's. It's about getting product to market fast. Think fashion, the model pioneered by H&M and Zara. Lego's come a long way, from near collapse to astonishing success. But what of the future? One thing is certain, Jürgen Knudstorp will always look at the journey he and his colleagues travelled to find out what is essential about the company that he leads. One he describes in a favourite T.S. Eliot poem. We shall never cease exploring, and at the end of all our exploring shall be to come back to the point where we began, but know it for the first time.